on it. And he just did this as a hobby retirement type thing. Well, he had did this also with parakites and some of the other kind of kites. But when he used this one, the wind coming off of the ocean would pull so he'd tie it to a fence post and pull a fence post out. The last thing he did, he tied it to the back of his Chevy pickup truck for an anchor, and on windy days it was scooting the back of the pickup around. So now you notice he's got more lift than anything he had, and he thought, boy, you ought to take out to Notre Dame and see if he's really got something. Well, they put it in the wind tunnel, and it had a better L over D than anything they had ever tested in the wind tunnel. At that time, it, was, it looked similar to what they do today, the open cells, but it had tails on both ends to make it stabilize as a kite, so it would set stable and they could read the advertising. And, and at that time, it was strictly a kite. So Notre Dame cleaned it up, put it in the wind tunnel. We dropped many weight tests and things to try to make a better shoot out of it. And then, uh, instead of jumping out of an airplane first, I put a parachute harness on and then a 750-foot um, nylon tow line, and they could tow me up. And it towed me up to almost 700 feet, release the line, and fly it down. And that was when the first time we could control it. We found out by warping the wing. Then we just warped the wing instead of just pulling the, the lines like we do today. But we could turn this thing, and we could go where we wanted to. Once they had a parafoil design, they had a small obstacle to overcome. They didn't have any machines for sewing together fabric. To make up the very first ones there, uh, we weren't parachute makers or anything like that, or we didn't have access to them. And just down the street was an awning company that made awnings for buildings. And so we went down to these women and told them what they want, wanted done, and they had no idea what we was making, but they would follow our pattern. So they sewed it up. So it was just a sewed up uh, awning. <laughs> and uh, we flew it. When they had a flyable parachute, the design team wanted to create a method for pilots bailing out of airplanes to fly themselves back to friendly lines. The logical progression was to somehow provide thrust to drive the parachute. If we could just fly them back, you know, they were, they were bailing out at high enough altitudes, they had quite a bit of time to go. And so uh, we wanted them to get a, a controllable parachute that they could control back to our lines and hopefully power it back which never actually came to that. Uh, the closest thing we, I guess, came to it was uh, we took a Martin Baker ejection seat and put a JADO rocket under it. And we thought this would be great. Well, if you know about JADO, when you fire it, you can't shut it off. And so here I am with a 90-second JADO rocket, and the seat is clear out here, and it shoots streaming back here, and we're going. And uh, it was the most wonderful time in my life when that thing ran out of <laughs> fuel and quit and became a regular parachute again. That was a wild ride. When the JADO experiment had less than desirable results, another method of providing thrust was implemented. The development at that point kind of split into two groups. We had one group at Notre Dame that worked on just the, the parachute. They were just jumping in and trying to improve the parachute. I kind of went with the group that was going to try to power it. And to, to start out first, we, we needed to know how the chute was going to act under power, because now we was pushing it instead of letting it glide, we was going to be pushing it. And I was flying a gyrocopter at that time, so I took the rotor off the gyrocopter and put the chute on. Now I put the same chute on, I was jumping, and I wanted to fly my gyrocopter on weekends, so I did not modify it, I, I hooked it up where the rotor went. Later on, instead of using Lowell's gyrocopter, a specific purpose airframe was constructed. This is in the 60s. There's no good engines, and I'm building up one of the real early Volkswagen engines for it, carving our own propeller, and not knowing too much about propeller design for slow speed. Our propeller, propeller efficiency was poor, and we was using direct drive. Uh, there wasn't redu reduction drives available then yet. So that one did fly, but when we calculated, we was flying about 12 horsepower at the propeller. The propeller efficiency was so poor. We, and there again, um, the takeoff was very, very poor. We almost had to be towed up. Then it had enough power to keep flying. Uh, you'll notice that that and pictures of that machine had quite a large rudder. We thought we could turn the whole thing with rudder. Uh, well, this was the first time it proved that the, uh, once you start flying, the, the wing is so uh, stable that the wing goes where you're guiding it with the wing warping. And the cart, you can turn the cart and all it does is, is bend the lines. We can turn the cart sideways and everything, but the wing keeps going where it's going. You have to warp the wing 
uh, or pull the, the shroud lines to turn the wing. So the rudder, the only effect the rudder had was when you're coming in for a landing in a crosswind, the wing could be running crosswind to hold its angle, and with the rudder we could turn the car in any direction we wanted to keep it down the runway. So we did use rudder for that effect. Because the thrust was low from the inefficient propeller, a tow car was often used to get the aircraft airborne. To get, it, to get the efficiency, we was towing it up, then coming on the power and flying the machine. So, um, needing a tow cart, we was at the airport, the professor had a convertible, he said, well, you just use his convertible. So we tie it on the convertible. Now, the professor had never drove a sailplane uh, towing or any towing or anything, had no idea what we had been testing, so he's driving his convertible, we take off, and he just heads for the other end of the field. And I need to come on the power and loosen the tow line before I pull the disconnect. Well, he's just heading out and feeling it's just so tight, and I'm just zooming up so tight that he's pulling the line down, and I know I'm in big trouble. So while it's really tight, I pulled the release. When I pulled the release, it was so tight I did a complete loop, and so I'm probably the only one that has ever looped a powered parachute. Experiments to increase speed of the Ram Air parachute nearly cost Lowell his life. We, we should have been smart. Everything at from 25 to 30 mile an hour worked well. Wanting to settle in at 28, 29 mile an hour, that all worked well, and as they found that today works real well. At one point, we wanted to go real fast, and so we knew that the drag of the chute was causing it, so we reduced the angle of attack, and we went faster. So we reduced it again, and about the third time, we are now going 45 miles an hour, and it's on film, and it works, and boy, we think this is great. We reduced it again, and at about 47 to 50 miles an hour, it started diving uncontrollably and dipping. And it would dip down and pick up speed, and then I had no control, and then it would pull up and so forth. In one of these dips, it dipped, dove so hard it hit the ground. And of course, the cart hit and rolled, knocked me out. When it would hit the ground, it would take the weight off the chute. The chute would violently pull up but then the weight back on it again and pulled down and hit again. And the film shows it going clear across the whole airport perimeter, keep hitting and docking, and, and of course I am out, I'm strapped in, but I'm knocked out. And um, so I got broken up kind of bad in that thing. In fact, when I recovered and played the film back, that was the only time it brought tears to see that. <laughs> and so th from that though, we realized there is an angle of attack, the chute must run to be safe, and that's where it must run and these are not going to go fast. Uh, if you go fast, it's dangerous. Um, there may be new technology come along someday when we can change the wing area or something and go faster, but at this point, uh, the angle of attack is pretty well fixed where it has to be safe. The project upon which Lowell worked eventually led to the first incarnation of a commercially available powered parachute. Freedom Flyer was the very first one that I knew about in a powered parachute. And then that kind of broke off into the um, Steve Snyder made the paraplane, which we have a couple of here, the original ones, the, the little two-engine two uh, counter-rotating props that he did. So they were the original production one was the paraplane.